Good morning, adventure. Hey, we are getting ready to worship in here. If you're in the hallway, you're not worshiping, so come on in. This is the adventure where we are worshiping Jesus, sharing Jesus, growing in Jesus. If this is your first time here, we welcome you. Glad to see you here. Fill out one of those cards on the back. Look for the ones that say the adventure, not that other church. We don't care about them. No, we care about them. They're good people. I know. I never said I was a good person, man. <laughs> but they keep putting me up here, so you got to deal with me. <laughs> but yes, that is what we are here for. It's what we're here to do. Uh, a couple of announcements. First, make sure that if you haven't gotten one, get your newsletter from the foyer. That's where it's going to tell you everything that's going on this month. So check that out. If you don't check it out and you don't know what's going on, guess whose false fault it is? It's not Shannon's fault. <laughs> so make sure that you check that out so you know what's happening. Second, and this is most important, today is potluck day. Yeah. Food. I like it. I love food. Shannon made cookies today, so I got to make sure I get some of those. But today is potluck day. Um, and we have, boy, this is a month of food, man. We got a lot of things going on with food. At the, on the, our fifth Sabbath, that would be... Uh, this will be September 29th because it will be Friday evening instead of the next day on Sabbath, Saturday morning. It will be Friday evening. We are having our fifth Sabbath evening service, which is going to be something called an agape feast. I have never done one of these before. If you've done one of these before, you know what's going to happen. If you haven't done one of these before, come find out with me because I'm interested to know what an agape feast is all about. I do know that there's going to be a bunch of tasty stuff because I got to sample some of it um, from... Her back there carrying a baby. She, uh, she, made, she made some really tasty breads and stuff that we're going to get to sample that night. So um, I get a little, I have a little knowledge of what's happening. And so you would like to be a part of that too because it's good stuff. Um, let's see here. Oh, if you are interested in being part of the pastoral search committee because unfortunately we are, our time with Ricky and Brooke is limited and we have to start that process of looking for a new pastor. If you're interested in that, Check with Carly back there. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. There she is. Carly back there. Talk to Carly about getting on that pastoral search committee and being a part of that voice and, and uh, helping us to, to look for that next person that will come and serve us in that capacity. Um, oh, I already talked about the newsletter. There is, was supposed to be a class after church today led by Lynette. That will not be happening if you were expecting that. That's not happening today, so don't look for that. And um, the last thing is next week after church, we will be having a farewell party for Ricky and Brooke. They'll be having immediately after church. Food will be provided so everybody can just stick around after church and we can say our, our farewells well. It'll be our early farewells, but, you know, and it'll be our last chance to try to convince him not to go, but, you know, he's probably not going to listen. But, uh, <laughs> but so that will be next week immediately after church, so make sure you're paying attention to that. Spread the word. We haven't had a lot of time to, to get that word out, but uh, be a part of that as well. So now I will end. I'm going to ask Amber from Adventist Christian School to come on up. She's going to have our children's story. Kiddos, you can go to the back there, get those buses and bring them up, get them filled up with those dollar bills, and that money goes to help Adventist Christian School. And so that'll be a little piece of that little ministry that you can be a part of. you want to come up here, I have treats for you. <laughs> Big kids are welcome, too.
right, good morning, happy Sabbath. All right, I want to know what is this? What is this? Who can tell me? What is this? A crayon. Oh, he said it's a bag of crayons. Right, what would happen if all the crayons in this bag were brown? Would that be very fun? Would we be able to make a really pretty picture if they were all just brown? What about if they were all just gray? Or if they were all just orange? Would that be fun? No. We have a bunch of different crayons in this bag because that's how God made us. He made us all different. He made us all unique. And he gave us the ability to have our differences. Some people are loud and funny like Matt. <laughs> Some people are quiet and shy. Some people are really, really good at music like Morgan, or they're really good at painting, or they're really good with numbers, or they have lots of knowledge to share with us, and we can tell when we look at their hair color. <laughs> um, but we're all different, and God made us all different so that we can come together and make a beautiful picture in our world. So if I were to draw a rainbow on here, does this look like a very good rainbow? Does that look very fun and very colorful? No, it doesn't, right? But if I were to use all of the crayons in here to draw a rainbow, would it be better? Yes. So each one of us is important. Even though we're different from each other, we're all important and we all get to be part of God's rainbow in our world. So our Bible verse today is found in 1 Peter 4.10. And it says, God has shown you his grace in giving you different gifts. And you are like servants who are responsible for using God's gifts. So be good servants and use your gifts to serve each other. And uh, that is all that I have for you. So if you'll bow your heads with me and we can pray. And then I'll give you a little taste of the rainbow. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today, and thank you for blessing us and for making us all different and unique so that we can come together in this world and make a beautiful picture for you. We ask that you help us to use our gifts according to your will, and we thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's have some prayer before we get really into this worship service here. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your dedication to us, for the things you do for us throughout the week. We're, all, we're grateful for the opportunity now to show a little bit of that gratitude for what you've done for us this week. Um, we pray for the continued uh, speaking of your Holy Spirit to our hearts, and especially now as we... Uh, try to lift our words up to you, Lord. We pray that your spirit will be the one who speaks through us so that the words spoken to you actually come from you. And um, we pray that we just we lift up you, we lift up those who are up here that will be helping us to sing, that you will be speaking through uh, Ricky today, and that uh, the message we hear will serve to... Um, to glorify you, and then, then we will in turn be able to take that into the world and glorify you to the world. Uh, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We invite you to stand with us as we start with some worship. Sense. 
But you say that's what faith is from When I see a flood, you see a promise When I see a grave, you see a dome And I'm at my end, you see where the future starts I don't know how you make a way From heat and desire through every dead end and out of that grave, I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. When the world's on fire, it's not like you don't have a plan. And when the earth gives way on this rock, your church will surprised you. Nothing has ever made you flinch and when it all shakes out, the gates of hell don't stand a chance. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. You've been good on every promise.
Take this mountain away Take these ocean tears Hold me through the drought Come like hope again Even when the fight seems lost I'll praise you even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. Even when it makes no sense to sing louder than I'll sing your praise. How Yeah, my heart burns only for you You are all, you are all I want Yeah, my soul waits only for you And I will sing till the morning has come Lord, my heart burns only for you. You are all, you are all that I want. Yeah, my soul waits only for you. And I will sing till the miracle comes. I will only sing your praise. Even when the morning comes, I'll praise you. Even when the fight is won, I'll praise you, even when my time on earth is done, louder than I'll sing your praise. I will only sing your praise.
Just give me Jesus When I am alone Oh, when I am alone Oh, when I am alone Just give me Jesus Give me Jesus Just give me Jesus. When I come to die. Just give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be here, that you have given us the urgency, the need, the desire to be here. And Father, I just ask that you would provide today. That whatever we're needing, whether it's hope, whether it's encouragement, whether it's an overwhelming outpouring of love, whatever it is, that, uh, that you would provide it here today. We are here to listen to you and you alone. Uh, we don't want it unless it's you. And so speak loudly, sp speak clearly, and um, allow for... Um, Yes, allow for your will to be done uh, here today. Uh, we love you and we praise your name. We pray and everybody said, amen. amen. <laughs> I love kids. You may be seated. Yes, you may be seated. Uh-oh, we had a little accident. Yeah, no, no worries. No worries. Um, happy Sabbath to all of you guys. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here. If this is your first time, thank you for doing that. I don't know where the table went. Um, if this is your first time here, we're glad that you're here. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope that you leave with more hope than when you came in. And if you've been here for a thousand times, uh, it's always lovely to see you as well. Okay. Before I get started with the sermon, though, I would like to um, 
bring up a couple of really special people, lovely people. Uh, you might know them very well. Uh, I want to bring up the Bender family, specifically Caroline um, and Andrew. Um, we're going to have a little baby dedication before we start, which is really exciting. Um, come on up, and I know that there's also very special people with you guys here today. Um, I don't know uh, how long it's been exactly, um, but uh, Kevin and Kathy are here. Uh, if you don't know Kevin and Kathy, you should. Uh, they're angels. We love them very much. And I'm very excited uh, that you guys are here. Thank you for being here. Um, it's lovely to be here. I know that the church um, is very, man, there's a lot happening right now. It's all right. It's all right. It's just coffee. We're good. We're good. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you for helping out. We're, we're okay. Just a little liquid. Um, I know that it's been a really difficult journey for you guys to to be here. And so I just want to welcome you back to your church. This is your church. This is your family. Um, these are people who love and care for you. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just, I'm overjoyed at the fact that they're here. Um, this church isn't the same without you guys here. So we love having you. Thank you for being here, okay? Um, they've come for a very special occasion, obviously. Um, we have a little Aspen Jordan. Look at her. She's so cute. Isn't she? Um, and I wouldn't expect anything less from me, too, because look at Sage. My goodness. The cutest little baby I've ever seen. Aren't you? Yes. Um, I, I feel very honored and privileged because they've, they've asked us to do uh, this baby dedication. Um, these are two phenomenal people that we've grown to love. All of these guys, actually, are, are people that we've grown our, to love in our time here. Um, and so I wanted to make this very special for you guys because you guys are very special to us. Um, this is Aspen Jordan, um, uh, born to two incredible parents who begged and pleaded for quite some time to have children. And if you guys don't know the story of how they ended up with two kids, it's a miraculous one. Um, they actually weren't supposed to have kids. Um, Caroline was begging and pleading and um, asking God that he would provide her children. Um, I know that in talking to her and, and hearing a sermon that she's done in the past here at the adventure, she would t tell all of you guys that the biggest thing that she felt that God was calling her in life was to be a mother. And there was this really difficult uh, space that she lived in for a while of living in the reality of not having children and thinking that she might not have it with the reality of the promise that God gave to her of being a mother. And now look, she has two, which is beautiful, which is beautiful. I know that for Andrew, um, this occasion is just as important. I know that together they've, they've been through a lot. They've, they've been on their knees a lot, um, begging and pleading the Lord for this provision, and, and he came through for them. I, I want to read a really special text for them um, that they kind of uh, picked out for today. Uh, it's found in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 1. And I kind of want to give you some context here. We have um, this incredible woman of God named Hannah, who you understand. <laughs> I think of anybody in the scripture, I, I think that you would understand her position. Uh, she, wasn't, she wasn't literally able to have children. Her womb was closed, the Bible says. But she had this calling of wanting to be a mother. She, all she wanted was to do that. And so she pleaded and pleaded and pleaded to the point where her husband even thought that she was drunk sometimes because she would just like cry and wail. And she was like, nah, man, I'm just passionate. And I know where I got to go to ask for this provision, right? Um, she came to God, God answered her prayer. And then we pick up where uh, Hannah decides to bring her child to the Lord in verse 22. She says, as soon as the child is winged, I will bring him that he may appear in the presence of the Lord. And then notice what it says, and remain there forever. Woof. What a text. As soon as the child is winged, I will bring him up, in this case, Aspen, up. 
that she may appear in the presence of the Lord and remain there forever. That is what a dedication is all about. That is why you're here. That is why you've elected to be here. That is why you've elected to allow for Aspen to be dedicated here in front of your church family that you guys have been a part of for 10 and almost 25 years respectively. Um, To bring her into the presence of the Lord so that she can be dedicated here, but also so that she can remain here forever. What you're doing is incredibly special. What you're doing is something necessary. And what you're doing is something that God is going to honor for the rest of your life and for the rest of her life. God absolutely wants, desires, and cares for her to be present with him. He wants nothing else than to be able to overflow her with his love and his care. And one of the main ways that he wants to do that is through you guys, is through you too, is through you guys as parents. And so this baby dedication, yes, we're bringing the child before the Lord so that she can remain there forever, but also we're doing the same with her parents. And now especially after the second child is here, more than ever, you would know that patience runs thin. (laughs) It's a much more difficult task to carry for two. But if there's anybody who's fit, it's both of you guys. If there's anybody who I trust with children, it's you guys. If there's anybody who's been called to be parents, it's you guys. I've seen the way that you talk. I've seen the way that you walk. I've seen the way that you care for your kids. It is utterly, utterly a calling and utterly beautiful and inspiring for us. Um, And so I want to dedicate you guys as well And as well as grandparents, I know Lily and Jed, they're not able to be here. I'm sure you're watching. Hi, we miss you. Come back. That'd be lovely. Um, But we want to actually dedicate your entire family along with with Aspen here today. Um, And if you wouldn't mind, I just want to lay hands over over Aspen. And then um, if we kind of just want to tuck in a little bit more, I'd actually, um, Brooke, if you want to come in here, and then I'll just come on this other side and lay hands over you guys, and then we'll pray over you. Okay? Let's do it. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this lovely family. Um, Thank you for provision. Thank you for answering prayer. Thank you for giving miracles. Thank you that that we have two beautiful girls in our midst who get to grow up in this place with these people. But more importantly, with these parents, with these grandparents, who are going to love them and care for them until the day they can't. Thank you, Jesus, um, that you are here with us, that you're here with them. And I'm just begging and pleading that you would give them the wisdom and knowledge that, um, that only can come from you, that comes from above, to be able to raise little Aspen um, in your way, um, where it can literally be that every single moment of her life she knows for a fact that she's in your presence, that you're with her, that you've never left her, nor will you ever, that she's specially anointed and called, that she has been put on this earth for a purpose, that she is a little miracle, that both of these girls are little miracles for them, and that there's obviously something that you want to do with them um, that entails kingdom things, great things, lovely things. So I ask that um, you be with Andrew and Caroline as they lead these girls. Um, Bless them, Jesus. Anoint them with patience and kindness and love, with with your overwhelming uh, presence, with your spirit that will um, be imparted upon these little girls so that they would know every single day of their life that, yes, their parents love them, um, but more importantly, because of their parents' love, they know that you love them. And so we lay them at your feet. They're your children. They're yours. Um, Mold them, create them, shape them how you want them to go, and may Andrew and Carolyn be a part of that. I also want to pray for Lily and Jed and for Kevin and Kathy, four wonderful human beings. May they be the support um, that Andrew and Caroline need. May they be the grandparents that they need. Um, be with them, restore them, heal them as they're going through the things that they're facing and unite this family in the way that they never thought possible. Um, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this opportunity, Jesus. In your name we pray and everybody said, amen. The last thing that we like to do um, is, uh, yes, lay these guys up in in God's hands, um, but we also want to have a commitment be made, um, not just from them to raise these kids in the way of the Lord, but we want to make sure that this church is committed to them, to making sure that we are helping them in their commitment to raising their kids in the way of the Lord. And so if you are a member of this church, if you belong to the adventure, if you've been a part of the adventure for 25 years or six months or two weeks, 
whoever you are. This is your family. These are your kids. These are your children. We have a responsibility to them, to grow them, to shape them, to love them, um, and to support them. So if that's you and you're committed to doing that, I'd like for you to stand up to show your support and your commitment to this family, to these kids, and promising them that you're going to do everything possible to make sure that you're going to support them. Okay. You see this. Yes? Hold them to it. Hold them to it. If they're promising to be family, make sure that they are. And vice versa, hold them to this idea that they're going to raise their kids in the way of the Lord, okay? Support them. Be with them, church. Do what you can to make sure that this little girl, these both of these little girls, know that God is with them and that he loves them, okay? Thank you so much. Blessings to you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. You may be seated. Thank you. Baby dedications are, are one of my favorite things to do. They're absolutely a gift. So thank you guys for, for the opportunity of letting me do this. How you guys doing? How we doing? Doing okay? Second to last sermon with you. I guess I better be good. <laughs> it better be good. Uh, I need you to go... Uh, to the book of Second Kings, I I messed up and I miswrote it on the screen. I put it as First Kings. Please forgive me. It's Second Kings. Go to the book of Second Kings, chapter four. What chapter? Chapter four. And we're going to read verses just one and two to start. Okay, verses one and two. Second Kings 4, verses 1 and 2. This is what Scripture says. Now, the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha. Your servant, my husband, is dead and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. So then Elisha turns to her and says, what can I do for you? What shall I do for you in your present circumstance? Tell me, in fact, what do you have in your house. To which the widow answered, nothing at all, except for a jar of oil. Ooh. Wanna preach on the topic when you're down to nothing. When you're down to nothing. I don't know if this story is a story that you can relate to. I don't know if anybody's ever come up to you and asked you how you're doing and you can't find words to express the emptiness that you feel. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever come up to you and, and try to check in on you and say, hey, how can I help you? And you can't come up with the way with a way to be able to describe the sorrow, the heartache, the emptiness that you're dealing with. I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you've lost everything, not just a house or a home or money or bank accounts or shoes or clothes. Um, I don't know if you've ever been just maybe in a place where you've lost all hope. And somebody comes up and, and, and tries to engage with you and, and, and be kind to you and ask you how you're doing. 
and you have a visceral reaction to their silly question. <laughs> uh, not because you don't like the person, but because you're incapable of answering in any other way, but in that specific way, in a way where it depicts the emptiness, the heartache, the nothingness that you're feeling. I don't know if you've ever been there. The story is, is, is one that, that, was, that was heavy on my heart um, over the last oh, 12 hours, probably. Um, the reason is because, uh, I'll confess something to you, I think you've known this already, but uh, normally I like to have a sermonic calendar done six months in advance. But obviously we're not doing the six months thing anymore. We have three weeks left, right? And so looking down at what was being planned for the rest of the year, I've been trying to really pray through what God is wanting to share with our church before we take off. I'm trying to see exactly what it is that God is trying to say. And so to be very honest with you, this week was a hard week. Uh, this was unlike any other week in terms of trying to figure it out and knowing exactly what to say the second to last time that I'm going to be up here with you guys. Um, to the point where it actually wasn't till last night at about 11, probably, 9, Brooke says, that's much more generous than I thought, uh, till about 9 o'clock last night where I knew what I was going to say. And so when I say the last 12 hours, I mean that. And it's a story that broke me. Um, while at the same time, I, I didn't really know how to share it uh, for a couple of reasons that we'll discuss here in a second. But the story, I really have been wrestling with it over the last 12 hours and trying to figure out how to present it in a way that is meaningful and hopeful to you, in a way that um, allows for your attention to be arrested and to be full of, of whatever it is that, that you're needing, right? But the beginning of this story sets a tone that I think most of us can relate to. Being in a place where you're left with nothing. When you're down to nothing, when you're totally empty, where you're totally void, um, when you have nothing left to give, literally, maybe even figuratively, where everything's been taken from you, where your energy has been sucked away from you, where all of your money has been taken from you because of unfortunate circumstances. Some of you guys know exactly what that is. This woman has lost everything. She's a widow. So the beginning of her loss begins with her husband. I don't know where you stand. I don't know where you sit today. I don't know what your... Uh, trajectory to coming to this church today is, but I hope that you haven't lost your husband or your wife. It's a devastating loss, and, and, and not even in death, but maybe through just divorce, maybe through infidelity, maybe through uh, a lack of relationship. Maybe you've lost your spouse, and you would know for certain that that loss is a big loss. Because when you marry somebody, you married them forever. For hopefully, till Jesus come and then, comes and then some, right? You're, you're hoping and praying that this relationship is exactly what you believed it was when you started, right? This person easily becomes your entire world. And then the moment when they're not there anymore, your world crumbles. This woman, though, has... Have, has it a little bit more difficult in that her husband has actually died. He's no longer with her, and this is a very difficult situation, specifically in this time culturally. We've talked about it before because if you're a woman during this time, you don't have anything. The man is responsible to work and to uh, pay bills and, uh, and, and to make ends meet. And so if you lose your husband, you lose everything as a woman. And the unfortunate reality that this woman is facing, that this widow is facing, is that not only did she lose her husband, but unfortunately, through their life together, they accrued enough debt to the point where now that he's not alive, she is now responsible to pay back that debt. But she doesn't work. She probably hasn't been able to accrue a lot of skills in her life because she has been 
utterly dependent on her husband. It was just what it was during this time. And so not only has she lost the love of her life, not only has she lost her world, she's losing everything else. Have you been there when, when losing your husband wasn't enough and the enemy came after everything else? You guys have heard this before, when it rains, it pours. Have you been there? When it seems like it can't get worse, oh, it gets a whole lot, it gets a whole lot worse. When you think that you can't get any lower, the elevator just keeps on going down. When you feel like you can't lose anything else, you lose your house, I remember, man, uh, as an immigrant here in America, I know that we had it pretty difficult. I remember, ooh, wow, I forgot about that. Wow, yeah. I remember coming to America and not knowing the culture or the language and not being able to see my dad for three or four days at a time because he had to work and work and work in order for us to have a small apartment that had nothing in it. And I remember in time, you know, you were able to accrue, you know, stuff. But hard, hard times fall on most people. And if you haven't noticed, really, really, really difficult times fall on people who follow Jesus. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. That's what happened in our life to the point where I remember I was sitting outside of our apartment and a tow truck ended up coming and putting my dad's car onto the tow truck. Um, they're repossessing the vehicle because I, I figure we haven't been made, making payments because we're in, in difficult times. Have you been there? Where maybe you're outside of your house and your kids are playing outside and somebody comes to take away your house and all the toys that the kids had have to remain inside and the kids are going outside and screaming and are not understanding exactly what's happening and all they want is just to play with their toys. Have you been there in that position? Lose everything. And when you lose everything, it's easy to then lose hope, isn't it? I think that the enemy is really strategic in this context. I want to call the enemy the creditor who sees that your life is in ruins, and he wants to ruin it that much more, and so he's coming to take everything else that you have. The thing that he really wants to take is your hope. He wants to snatch your hope. And why does he want to snatch your hope? Well, if you didn't know, scientists are talking about the fact that if you have no hope, you're more likely to take your own life. Hope is one of the major essence is of life. That if you completely lose hope, it's easy to just give up. It's easy to stop moving forward. It's easy to just see your circumstance as complete reality instead of trying to see what God is trying to do outside of it. The creditor is coming to snatch away your hope because hopelessness is said to darken your world by draping your thoughts in darkness, depriving you of clarity of thought. It's a condition, it's a condition that scientists are, are now claiming is, is a condition that just sucks the joy and life away from the host. We all have been built with a deep psychological need for hope. We weren't designed to be hopeless. And so if we weren't designed to be hopeless, if the creditor, the enemy can come to take your hope, you have nothing left. So whatever he can do to destroy you while you're down, he's going to do that. Doom and gloom every single day. Have you been there? Doom and gloom every moment of your life, waking up feeling Disturbed, perturbed, saddened, angry, sluggish, distant, tired, unwilling, and unable to carry out essential duties of your day. 
without thinking and reverting to the reasons for your hopelessness. Some of you guys have been there. Where you understand that hopelessness kills. This is precisely where the widow is. She's not just down on her luck, she's hopeless. She's got nothing left. She doesn't have what she needs to get through this situation. She can't stand to lose her children. She doesn't feel like she has what she needs to fulfill. Excuse me, she doesn't feel like she has um, anything in her to fulfill what she needs to fulfill. She has nothing left to give. She's completely out of energy. She doesn't have the capacity to be mom anymore. She knows what it takes to get through the situation, but she realizes that she doesn't have it. So she does what any person would do when they've reached rock bottom. They're willing to do anything to get out. A man of God ends up approaching her and she takes her shot. And she says something really, really important. Verse one on the screen. My husband was one of you. He was a student in the school of prophecy. He was a servant of the Lord. He loved the Lord. He feared the Lord. Now he's gone and now the creditors come to take everything else I have for me, specifically my two sons. They're wanting to make him slaves to pay back for all the debt that I've accrued. And then how does Elisha respond? What shall I do for you? What do you need? In fact, not just what do you need, what shall I do for you? Notice what he says. He says, what do you have? What do you have? What's left? After the dust has settled, what do you have left? What remains? I think it's easy in difficult circumstances to be able or, or, or to not be able to see what we do have and only focus on what we don't. It's easy to get so blind to the present circumstance that it's very difficult to see what we do have left. It's easy to, uh, when, when we get down on our luck, to just uh, be able or to be unable to look around, to understand that, not everything is gone. Elisha understands this, and he asks her this question, what do you have? He understands the capabilities that God has. He understands that if he can just pick away at what she might be able to have, that God could probably use it what, what can we use here? I, I know my God. He's the God who created everything out of nothing. Come on. Uh, he's the God who created out of dirt, for goodness sakes. He's the God who created woman and, quite frankly, the rest of us out of one bone. So if you at least have one bone, if you at least have one breath, if you at least have one thing around, God could use it. So what do you have, widow? What do you have? What do you have left? To which she says, nothing at all. I am totally empty. I have been brought down low. Everything has been taken from me. My home, my clothes, my house, my car, my phone, whatever it is, it's gone. The only thing that remains are my two kids and they're coming after them. But then notice, it's almost like she stops and she says, wait, 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 I do have something. A jar of oil, a flask of oil. She remembers that she still has in her possession something seemingly insignificant. She's down to a measly flask 
of oil, something incredibly not worthwhile. This is the one thing that the creditor hasn't taken from her, this unimportant flask of oil. The creditor has forgotten to take from her the seemingly meaningless, undervalued parts of life specifically found in this jar, this flask of oil, which I praise God for. I really do, because in the creditor's oversight, God can recreate something. Thankfully, the enemy is not good enough at his job. In fact, God won't let him be good enough at his job. God continuously covers you to a way, in such a way where even if you've lost everything, you actually haven't. It's interesting that if we were really honest and we were really astute to the circumstances of our lives, we would see that it's actually in the undervalued parts of life where we find the most power in God. Because it's in these insignificant, seemingly insignificant, insignificant, undervalued things where God actually flips our lives upside down. Where he takes something that you never could have imagined he could have used to liberate you, to rescue you. And it's interesting that the way that the story depicts what she has left is in a flask of oil. Because if you have studied the Bible, I have been to this church even within the last just couple of years that we have been here. We've talked about this idea that biblically speaking, oil represents what? Most of the time, more often than not, oil represents God's spirit. Oil, specifically in the Old Testament, is used to identify God's presence in the believer's life. So notice when this widow has lost everything, one thing remains. This widow has lost everything, everything, yet one thing remains. You know what that everything is? Everything. See, when, when all is gone in your life, the spirit remains. When everything's been taken from you, the spirit remains. When you've lost all hope and you're full of doubts and feel like you can't get out of bed anymore, one thing remains, the spirit remains. When you have nothing left except a flask of oil, God says, Great, I can work with that. In fact, not only can I work with that, can I, can I take this a little bit deeper? Don't you think that this woman had already been begging and pleading for God to make a way? I don't know if you guys have been in this position before, but maybe you've been in a position where you're about to lose your house or your business or your marriage. It's not like when you got to the point of actually losing this thing, when you started to pray that God would salvage it. No, you started praying long before, years before, months before, days ago, right? There has been an accrued time on your knees of begging and pleading with God that he would do something different. And I know I, I've talked to most of you guys about this. Most of you guys have had some type of prayer, some type of issue happen in your life where you've begged God and it's been 20 years and God has yet to answer that prayer. Have you noticed that? Some of you guys have even come up to me and talked to me about this because it's been difficult for you to continue to praise God when it seems like you're being crushed. It almost seems as though when you started to pray for God to actually provide for you, it seems like more things, more bad things started to happen. Have you been there? It seems like when you actually involved God more in the situation, it seems like the situation got even worse. The moment where you actually started pleading that God would return your kids to you, where they got further and further away from you. Have you been there? When you realized that God was the thing that you needed, it was almost as if everything else started to fall apart. I, I want to suggest something to you, and I need you to listen to me, okay? 
please hear me out before you get uncomfortable with what I'm about to say. But what if God is needing you to lose everything? It's hard to hear. It's hard to accept. And I think that on the surface, it might seem as though God is cruel when I say something like that. But think about it for just one second. What if in this woman's situation, everything needed to be gone for her to finally realize that she needed everything? It's easy for me to look in my life and maybe in your life at how when we have lots of things, it's easy to place on ho our hope in those things. And so even though we want God, even though we desire God, he knows that even if he was to answer your prayer, it would be easy for you to write him off and say, no, it was just coincidence. It was just happenstance. Maybe God is strategic in answering prayer. Have you thought about that? Maybe he's incredibly strategic because at some point, depending on what you're losing, maybe you might just need to lose everything in order to figure out the fact that you need everything. God might need to put you in a circumstance where you're losing everything to finally get to a place of saying, I need you to have the eyes to see that he's the only one capable of providing for you. That maybe everything is being taken away slowly so that you can get to a place of finally saying, God, you're all that I need. You're all that I need. You're all that I can afford. You're all that I have left. And even though, the, again, on the surface, this sounds incredibly hard to understand. It's the most hopeful thing I think that I can think about. Because what it means is that God is leading me down this journey of fully understanding who he actually is and how much I desperately need him and how much he's the only one that can actually satisfy my needs, that will provide my needs, put me in a position where I can actually see a miracle. Because let's be honest, living in America is wonderful. In fact, I would say living in America is too wonderful. Some of y'all say amen for that. I don't say amen, though. I think, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm leaving, I guess. But I think that living in America has almost been detrimental for our faith. Because if I'm hungry, I just go down to the 7-Eleven right down here and get something for a buck or two or three. I live in, thank you, because everything's super expensive. You're right. You're right. Thank you for the correction. Think about it. Whatever need I have, I can do it myself. If I'm thirsty, I got a water fountain right there. And I'm thankful for that. Please don't hear that I'm saying that those are bad things. They're not bad things. I just think that sometimes our hope is placed too much in those things. In fact, I don't even think it's maybe those things as much as it is just ourselves in providing for ourselves. And maybe that's why we don't see miracles because we're not down to nothing, because we haven't lost anything, because we haven't lost everything in order for us to actually be able to see miracles. We used to pastor in, in the Dakotas and we ran this ministry. Uh, it was a collegiate ministry. We did campus ministries, public campus ministries. And I don't know if you guys knew this, I never talk about this. We, we ran an international ministry that we didn't even have much to do with other than setting up an environment for college students to be the church. You know what they did? These college students built a whole entire school. Our kids, they built a school in a refugee camp in Uganda. They sent countless of kids to school. They paid for their medical bills. They paid for their school supplies. We sent college students down there to nursing school. College kids who don't make anything. I remember one day, one of our college students showed up to our house, and she came with, she came with a check for $2,000. 
And she said, I believe in this ministry so much so that I wanna give everything I have to it. These 18 to 22 year old kids took kids to school, fed kids, built a campus, built a, 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 a well for these kids to have water. College kids, 20, some of them, 25 of them. And the main girl who did this, who had the audacity to have this vision, she's from Uganda. She came from a refugee camp. And you know what she used to say? She said, I really want to help out my people, obviously, because they're, they're in uh, really difficult situations. But also because in helping them, it actually helps us. That we don't go on mission to Africa to come to save them. No, most of the time we go there to be saved ourselves. Because you know where you find faith the most? It's in Africa. She used to tell us all the time, she said, you know where I see God the most? Is in the slums of Africa, in the struggle, in difficulty. She used to have to walk miles, a typical, stereotypical story of, of one of these girls in a refugee camp, where she used to have to walk for miles and miles and miles just to get water. And she said, you know where I found God? There. She said, in fact, coming to America was one of the hardest things for me spiritually because here, I don't need God. And one of the things that she wanted to do was to start this ministry in order to be able to find him again. Because it's when you're down to nothing when you see God. It's when you're totally empty when you see God. It's when your husband has died when you see God. It's when you lose your house when you see God. It's when you lose your friends when you see, when, when you lose your family, when you lose everything, when God can actually step in to show you who he is. It sounds difficult, I get it. But how great is it that even the most difficult circumstances of life, God has said, no, 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 they're not even that difficult because it's actually in those times where you actually see me the most. Where he's flipped even the creditor schemes on its head to, to where he actually makes it a success uh, in losing everything because what you gain is eternal life. That even the worst thing that could happen to you is the best thing that could happen to you. That God would be so kind and loving to take unfortunate circumstances to say, no, I'm with you forever. This woman is in this position. She's down to nothing. She has nothing left to, uh, to lose. But this jar, this empty, or this oil, uh, this, this flask of oil. So once she says that she has this left, Elisha simply turns to her and says, go to all your neighbors and get a bunch of empty jars. Not filled jars. Get a bunch of empty jars. Because it's an emptiness where we see that God can fill things. Come on. Empty vessels, and not just a couple. I need you to get as many as you can. Because the more emptiness, the more opportunities for God to fill. Amen. Then go shut the door behind you and your children and start pouring into all these vessels. When each is full, set it aside. So she left him and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her, and she kept pouring and so what happens? They run out of vessels and the oil stops pouring. The only way she was able to see that kind of provision and miracle from God was because she was empty, because she was left to nothing. The only way she was ever going to be able to see and understand and know that God is who he says he is, is by getting to a place where she couldn't continue anymore. She just follows. Think about, think about this for a sec. She just has a flask of oil. How does this flask of oil fill everything else? Yet she never questioned. She just filled. 
Because when you're empty, you can only expect for things to get better. Are you empty? Morgan, Jess, you can come up. Are you empty? Are you void of life today? Is your will to live gone? Is your joy, has your joy been sucked from you? Are you down to nothing? I have good news. The good news about being empty is that you're ready to be filled. And you're ready to be filled by the thing that matters the most, which is God's spirit and his spirit alone. It's time to bring your empty vessels. It's time to bring your empty jars. It's time to bring your nothing to God and be ready to be filled. What do you have? What do you have left over? Even the most insignificant things that you might think that God can't possibly use. Is that all you have? God sees that you have everything. God is ready to pour his oil, not just all over you, but into you. He's ready to give you hope, life, and joy through the remnants that you never thought possible. He's ready to fill you. God, I don't know who needed to hear this. I hope at least one. Somebody who is like me, who is down to nothing, who is left with nothing, who has nothing left to give, who doesn't have the capacity anymore to walk, to talk, to get up in the morning, to even eat, to go to the bathroom like, like, uh, like Saul before his conversion. I know that we've been talking heavy about this loss of life, this loss of hope, this uh, lostness, um, this emptiness that we sometimes go through in life. We've been going hard at it for a couple of weeks now, and I hope that it's been made clear to everybody here that you use empty situations, and not even that you use, that more often than not, You love those situations because it puts us in positions where all we have is you. All we can actually lean on is you. Not other people, not a church, not a job, not our husbands, not our wives, not our kids, as much as we would like to. We know that people fail us. Things fail us all the time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll say thank you now for putting us sometimes or allowing us to be put in difficult situations where we can finally realize that you're all that we need, that you're all we can trust, that you're everything. You're the everything that we need. Thank you for providing miracles in the midst of emptiness when we feel like we can't continue. It's when we see you most. Thank you for using the enemy's tactics to deliver us. Thank you that even the worst thing that could happen to us is the best thing, that even if we were to die, the next thing we see is you. Thank you that even if the enemy were to take everything from us, what we see is you. Thank you for emptiness. And this is my prayer, and and I'll say it for myself. And if somebody else in here wants to say it, great. But I'm going to say something crazy and something I'm very uncomfortable with, but I know that it's it's a biblical thing. Man, oh, geez. God, I want to pray for myself. In fact, I want to pray for this church too. Yes. I want to pray that all of us would be brought to a place of emptiness if we need to be. That you would be so good in bringing us to places where where we can't depend on anything other than you. 
so that we can finally step into life, so we can finally see you for who you are, so we can finally experience you, that you would get rid of everything else that has, has filled our lives, that has distracted us, that has taken us away from understanding your beauty and your glory and your love. So I'll pray that for me, do what you have to, if you have to ruin me, like Job says, for me to see your glory do it. If you have to stretch me, do it. If you have to remove some things from me, do it. If you have to remove some people from me, do it. Whatever you have to do so that I can be assured of my God and who he is, do it. And if anybody else has that prayer, this crazy prayer, listen, don't pray this prayer unless you mean it. Because with this prayer comes some hardship, but, but more than that, I ask you that you, would do, that you would pray it. Because even though it comes with hardships, it's going to come with the best thing that has ever happened to you. Which is God's overwhelming presence in your life and your ability to acknowledge it. So if that's you, stand to your feet. If you want to make this prayer, if you're willing to let God ruin you, to bring you down, to, to have you come to nothing, to take anything away from you that might be keeping you from having him as your everything, stand to your feet. If, 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 you're, if you're wanting God to have that type of say and permission in your life to just look at what's happening with you and to say, Ricky, I, I need you to get to a place of nothingness before I can answer your prayer. Because right now, if I were to answer it, you're just going to write it off as, as something other than a miracle. If that's you, stand to your feet. If all you want and desire is Jesus, nothing but Jesus, nothing else will do. If you're wanting to make room for just him, stand to your feet. God, you see your people. They want you. They want you. They're saying it. Now do what you have to. I want, I, I beg, like, like one of my favorite pastors likes to say, I, I want you to disturb the comfortable, disturb them, do what you have to, to lead them to a place where they can finally just say, I'm empty, I have nothing, I'm in ruin. But God, it means it's time for you. Do it, do it. May we come to nothing, knowing that you're up to everything. We love you. And we praise you and we thank you in your name. Amen. Here is where I lay it down. Every burden, every brown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Oh, and I will make room for you to do it. 
Jesus, we have everything we need. We always have. The problem is that we got a lot of stuff we don't. And we don't know how to get rid of it on our own, Lord. And so we ask you to take those things away. Move them out of the way. Get them out of our lives. Get them out of the path that we need to be on. And uh, help us to see that we don't need those things. Help us see that what we need is you. And what we need is only you. Make that our priority, Lord. Help us to make that our priority. Let us carry that thought forward now as we go our ways, Lord. As uh, we make our way down to Potluck, we pray that you will uh, bless the hands that provided the food today. We thank you for the food. And uh, we pray that our conversations there will continue to be a blessing on this Sabbath. And for those who do not join there, we pray that your presence will be them as they go forward to their plans for the rest of the day. With that, we ask... Uh, all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, it is potluck. If you're sticking around, make your way down the hallway, down the stairs. There will be plenty of food for everyone. Uh, if you need prayer, come on down. We will have some folks down here that will pray with you. Um, if you like the idea of keeping the lights on and the doors open, those little boxes down there are way of, your way of expressing that desire. So um, take, take advantage of those as well. Otherwise, uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for coming.